This video is sponsored by ya boy, NordVPN. A VPN is the best way to protect your data and online activity, and NordVPN is one of the best. They have over 5,200 servers across 60 countries and make it super easy with a one-click connect, getting you protected within seconds and hiding whatever degenerate activity and anime watching you don't want anyone to know about. My favorite thing, however, is using it to access geo-restricted content. If you have Netflix or whatever streaming service, you can connect to other countries to have an entirely different catalog to view. The UK and Australia have the best ones, by the way, as far as Netflix goes. NordVPN is available on all major platforms, so you can keep your computer safe at home, your phone safe while out using public Wi-Fi, and probably your weird Steam Linux Switch clone thing whenever it comes out. Yeah, I can do that because it's a PC. It's a PC. It is a PC. And again, because it's a PC. PC. God, I can't wait to play New Vegas out in the desert to get the real experience. I'm not going to drink water either. So if I fail hardcore mode in the game, I'll fail it in real life. And NordVPN will keep my data secure out there when I do. Go to nordvpn.com slash potential history or use coupon potential history to get a two-year plan plus a bonus gift with a huge discount. So... Australians are pretty based, and I doubt I'll get much pushback on that. Besides, come on, they do stuff like recover a tank from no man's land just to trigger the Germans. They're awesome. They're like the Americans of the Southern Hemisphere, but they're all from Florida. And I feel like we have a lot in common. We're both former British colonies. They were just nicer about leaving. We have strong independent streaks as a result of living on and taming our respective frontiers. And we tend to get really defensive when anyone brings up just how we went about doing that. You know, just bro stuff. They even had our back in Vietnam, unlike someone Britain. But in the realm of military history, it's hard to miss that Australians are like crazy good at war. And I don't mean operationally or anything like what people cite when saying other countries like Germany are good at war. Although you could pretty easily make the case that Germany is pretty bad at war. They have like one trick they do no matter what. God, there are going to be more comments about saying that than on the actual ship. <laughs> Anyways, Australia's good at war on the ground soldier level, in that their boys fight like Lita when she's cornered. My theory is that they're dangerous because they have nothing to lose. Think about it. They have a horrifying, boiling hot, broken landmass full of all kinds of deadly creatures that's often on fire to come home to. Maybe going down in a blaze of glory, taking as many enemy soldiers with you as possible, is the goal. Probably not, but growing up and living in such a rough environment clearly made them tough. A favorite Aussie military story of mine is that of the HMAS Sydney. Oh my god, I just now got to the topic and I'm like a half page in. Damn Australians being so fucking based, making me ramble on. For time's sake, I'm going to focus on two stories out of many you could tell about the ship. Because there are some... Interesting claims made about the ship's sinking that we need to discuss. They're 100% high-grade autism, and I must debunk them. Drakenfeld did an excellent video on Sydney's full service life and standout career in the Mediterranean that I recommend highly. In fact, uh, I'll do you one better. Here's Drakenfeld now in the not flesh actually on screen to give you an overview of the Sydney. You should still watch his video though. HMAS Sydney is part of the Leander class. Um, although, depending on which source you're looking at, she's sometimes described as a little bit of a subclass. They have an armament of eight six-inch guns in four twin turrets, um, a pair of super-firing turrets forward and a pair aft. Uh, they have an array of lighter anti-aircraft only guns, uh, which obviously varies depending on the ship, depending on the time period. As far as type is concerned, she's a light cruiser and she's kind of a lighter light cruiser which is not entirely unique to the Royal Navy, but certainly in the big three navies, they're less common. But the Leanders are designed to fulfill a role that the British and the British Empire as a whole, which includes Australia, has, which is they need holes to cover as many places as possible rather than individually more powerful ships because they have a massive global empire to protect. I uploaded my full conversation with Drakenfell on my Patreon page, and for just a dollar a month you can get access to it and all companion bonus material previously posted and to come. Commissioned September 24th, 1935, she took a detour on a first trip home to bully the Italians. Something that will become a reoccurring theme, enforcing sanctions they had incurred for their actions in Ethiopia. Eventually arriving in Sydney August 11th, 1936. She spent the rest of the interwar years in exercises and training, was about to leave for a trip to the Dutch East Indies when war, war were declared, declared, and she was diverted back home on a war footing. 
By June 1940, she had joined the Royal Navy's 7th Cruiser Squadron for operations in the Mediterranean, even though she was initially marked to join operations in the Red Sea. British Fleet Admiral for the Med, Andrew Cunningham, diverted her after seeing the Scrap Iron Flotilla in action, and grabbed up any Australian ships and crews that he could to boost his fleet's striking ability due to simply how impressed he was with the nation's sailors' performance. So he just yoinked the ship for himself, based entirely on Australian warfighting reputation. God, they're just so base! On the 10th of June, 1940, Sydney was a part of a group waiting in Alexandria for Italy's imminent war declaration at midnight to go bully their fleet the minute it was officially a combatant in free game. Sydney herself only got to throw some death charges. <laughs> Sydney herself only got to throw some depth charges. I can't fucking say that. Depth charges. Sydney herself only got to throw some death charges. But I love the idea of everyone so excited to sink Italian ships, they're counting the minutes till they can go catch them with their pants down. It's like stepping outside the bar to fight someone, and hiding against the wall by the door to jump on them before he sees you when he comes out. Absolutely savage. There's a lot of love for the Australian, the Ander class, uh, light cruisers in the Mediterranean fleet. They're pretty aggressive. They get involved in quite a number of engagements. Sydney's probably most famous single engagement in that period for her specifically, rather than as part of an overall fleet, is when she goes to the aid of some destroyers and chases down a couple of Italian cruisers. Around two weeks later on the 27th, as a Malta convoy escort, her group engaged three spaghetti destroyers, disabling one, the Espro. When the shooting stopped and the other two ran away, Sydney was ordered to fish out survivors and execute the damaged destroyer. The Italians, though, ungrateful for the gesture, fired two shells when Sydney was about 6,000 yards out. In line, but short. Since that was the way the Italians wanted to play it, Sydney fired four salvos in a death blow before resuming the approach and picking up 47 sailors, despite it leaving them very open to a possible submarine attack. After two hours of this, she was ordered away. But before leaving, the crew dropped a fully provisioned cutter for any other men they weren't able to grab. What a gentleman. He may attack, but he also protect when needed. She actually ends up firing so much that post-battle, um, you see her gun barrels, the paint has bubbled and stripped off of them because the, oh, the wow. guns got so hot from the, rate, the amount of fire they were chucking down range. Sydney rotated home late January 1941, arriving February 9th. In her time in the Med, she earned all of these awards, all while only losing a single man. And not to combat, but to illness. An amazing run by any standard, making the ship a legend in the Royal Navy, but especially at home, becoming a huge symbol of national pride for Australians. But it seems Sydney used up all her luck in that first deployment, as it would suddenly and catastrophically run out November 19th, 1941. Sydney was off the western coast of Australia when a merchant ship, that was actually a German converted raider Cormoran, was spotted. The Cormoran is part of a Hilfskreuzer program. Literally translated helping cruiser, auxiliary cruiser, is the more proper translation, so a little bit idiomatic. What the Germans had noticed in World War One was they had a bunch of converted liners and merchantmen acting as merchant raiders. They noticed certain ones were a lot more effective. They, they need a very specific balance of the ship has to be a merchant vessel rather than a liner so that it's efficient and can stay at sea for a very long time. And Cormoran is part of this overall um, effort. So she's very heavily armed for a merchant ship. She's got um, 5.9 inch guns, I like cruiser grade guns. She's got smaller weapons uh, for anti-aircraft and anti-shipping work. She's got torpedoes, she's got a large contingent of mines. So the idea of the Cormoran and her sort of half-sisters is to head out into the South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, the Pacific, basically anywhere that you won't expect to find purely military uh, escorted heavy convoys and start sinking, capturing, and destroying things. And that's what she's doing in, in the sort of Indian Ocean and Pacific regions around the time that she runs into Sydney. The ship immediately turned away from the coast, which was very sus. Get out of my head! Get out of my head! So she moved to intercept. While doing so, an incredibly farcical series of events transpired. Sydney made no fewer than five attempts to get the raider to identify. First by signal light, 
then a flag light combo, which got a signal flag response, but it was blocked by the smoke from Cormoran's funnel, and Sydney had to ask again. The enemy crew cleared the flag's line of sight, showing that they were claiming to be the Dutch vessel Strut Malacca, which is all well and good, except for the fact that it was not on the list of ships supposed to be in the area. But there could be more to the story. The ship could be lost or the record's wrong, and cautious about firing on a ship that could potentially be a friendly merchant vessel, Cindy continued to give the benefit of the doubt and signaled half of the ship's unique secret call sign, which the Germans, of course, did not know, and refused to signal back for 15 minutes until Sydney demanded a response. But knowing the jig was up, the Germans raised their colors, dropped camouflage, and the two began to duel. The Cormoran landed devastating hits to Sydney's bridge and gun director tower, along with damaging the forward turrets and setting fires almost immediately. This slowed Sydney's rate of fire dramatically, but she was still able to immobilize the enemy raider and inflict a good amount of damage herself. The battle hadn't been going long, though, before Sydney took a torpedo to the gut and her bow began to angle down due to the hit. Both ships, though, were heavily damaged and on fire, with Sydney trying to limp away and the Cormoran becoming immobilized. However, Cormoran continued to fire at Sydney as the distance between the two widened. Just the range itself is a significant factor here. If they were fighting it out full on, if they both knew what the other was at 15,000 yards, the odds of Cormoran hitting anything are basically roll a dice blind luck. Whereas with this particular engagement, because they managed to sucker Sydney in close enough, all of those warship-based advantages no longer matter. At which point you're now actually looking at ships that have broadly similar levels of armament, are roughly the similar in terms of displacement, and at that kind of range, there isn't a tremendous amount other to, you know, differentiate the two, except for who fires first. Light from the Sydney's fires all over the ship glowed on the horizon into the night for about four hours all told. The German crew reported it looking like the crew had lost all control of the ship. And a little bit after that, they lost complete sight of her. Around the time they lost sight of Sydney, though, Cormoran's crew abandoned her due to out-of-control fires getting close to the magazine, and she was scuttled. You kind of see actually how vulnerable something like Cormoran is, because the amount of fire that Cormoran puts into Sydney versus the amount of fire that Sydney puts into Cormoran is way disproportionate. But even the relatively small amount of fire Sydney manages to put into Cormoran is enough to mortally wound Cormoran, even if Sydney is mortally wounded in return. Sydney and her crew would never be seen above water again. After four days with no sight or sound of Sydney, a search was started. 318 out of the Cormoran's 399 personnel were found, but aside from a Carly float and a life belt, there was absolutely no trace of the Sydney. The German crew were interrogated, and they reported the battle that was just described. So that's the gist of HMAS Sydney's story. And I'm sure those of you hearing it for the first time are thinking, that's some bad luck, but nothing unbelievable. That, that all sounds pretty plausible. But oh, get ready to realize just how wrong you are. Buckle up, this goes from 0 to 10 real fast. <laughs> Immediately after the sinking, as the war was still going on, people began to question the official story of what happened to Sydney. The earliest theories actually originated in the press as a result of wartime secrecy. After a very delayed reporting of the ship's loss, very little information about the sinking was released by the government, which to some made it look like there was a cover-up. This was made even worse in 1942, when for some reason Radio Tokyo claimed to have the crew as POWs. The peak of Sydney conspiracy claims came in the mid-80s, when they were cemented into the public consciousness by Michael Montgomery's just truly awful book titled Who Sank the Sydney? His work took many disjointed and often contradicting conspiracy theories and put them down into one place, making him the unofficial leader of the movement in the process. There are a lot more of these than the three or so that stood out to me that I'm going to cover, but they're all the result of some people's inability, or just flat-out refusal, to accept that a converted raider was able to sink a purpose-built warship, and that there has to be an additional factor. Basic conspiracy theory stuff. The first one tries to explain how the Sydney could have possibly been lured so close to the Cormoran, giving up all tactical advantage she had from her armor and guns, both a greater asset at range, by claiming the Germans actually raised a faux white flag of surrender and fired on them before it was taken down. This would of course be a crime under the international rules of war, and the German crew must have all lied to cover it up. As you probably guessed already, there is no evidence for this. 
Also, can someone explain to me why it's okay for a ship to dress up as a different or friendly one? On land, that would totally be a war crime. I mean, Germans in the Battle of the Bulge were executed for wearing American uniforms. I guess maybe because it's a vehicle and that's kind of in a gray area like the War Crime Panther? I, I don't get that. Someone explain that to me. Conspiracy number two takes on many forms. But the gist is that after being heavily damaged, Sydney signaled to the Royal Navy reporting her situation and asking for assistance, and the Navy refused to do anything. Why? It varies, but it's always some flavor of to save face for the loss of a very famous ship. Sometimes the Navy ordered her to engage Cormoran, and once that went poorly, they go into full damage control mode. Other times it's more vague, but it all comes back to a Navy cover-up. This claim really blew up in 1975 when the war archives were opened, with somebody claiming that they found the report Sydney sent, but nobody has ever been able to actually produce the document. These theories are often paired with an even wilder claim, that the Navy hunted down and killed the survivors adrift at sea so nobody could talk and spill the secret. And yep, you guessed it, there's no solid evidence. The best theory for my money, though, is that it actually wasn't the Cormoran who sunk the Sydney, but a Japanese submarine, and the Royal Navy covered it up. Why? To get the Americans in the war, of course. If you've heard some of the Pearl Harbor conspiracies before, this will probably sound familiar. The story goes, the British knew about the Pearl Harbor attack, but didn't warn the US to maximize inflicted damage, so America would for sure have to go to war. So if word got out, Japanese submarines were running around sinking ships in the South Pacific, the US Navy might raise its readiness, December 7th would be a failure, and the US could stay out of the conflict. At least, that's what I believe the line of thinking is. This stuff can get really hard to follow. So to ensure the US joins the war, nobody can know who really sank Sydney. There are two issues with this one though. Uh, one, the British and the Commonwealth were not at war with the Japanese but the Germans, and it's the war in Europe they want the Americans involved in. We take it for granted the US went to war with Japan and Germany at pretty much the same time, but that only happened because Hitler declared war. The road to America fighting in Europe is not a straight shot from Pearl Harbor to D-Day, so this whole plan really doesn't make any sense for the British to pursue. Second, it's well documented where all Japanese subs were at the time of Sydney's sinking and none of them were anywhere near the Sydney's location. And I guess third, although this is kind of a given at this point, there's no hard evidence for any part of this theory. By the 90s, the waters were so muddied for this whole topic, conspiracy believers were infighting about contradicting theories, and Montgomery and friends were lashing out at anyone trying to be objective. But in March 2008, the wrecks of both ships were found, and upon study, they pretty much confirmed the official story beyond a doubt. With the evidence that they provided contributing to an official inquiry, the result of which was the Cole Report. Link below, good read. That has mostly put the issue to bed, except for some hardcore holdouts who, even after the discoveries, held on to the myth, giving us gems like this. Cover up. As I said before, all of these conspiracy theories come from an inability to accept that a converted raider, the Cormoran, could sink the Sydney, a wildly successful purpose-built warship that was a legend and huge patriotic symbol for Australians. Yes, on the surface it seems odd, but the captain probably wasn't duped by a white flag to approach and be fired upon illegally. Could he have gone about identifying the Cormoran in a better way? Yes, but he didn't. He got very close and in the process created a tactical advantage for the Cormoran, due to Sydney's advantages being centered upon engaging from a longer distance. So option one, he could have launched a float plane. Secondly, if he didn't want to launch his scout aircraft and he was determined to close in, then at the very least, if he had any suspicions about what the ship was, he should have had every single gun that he had manned and aimed at it. By not having everyone ready, it meant that when Cormoran dropped its disguise and opened fire, mm -hmm. they weren't ready to respond. Whereas if they had been primed and ready, then the minute Cormoran you know, dropped its disguised panels so that its guns could be uncovered and aimed, they could have been there ready with rounds in the breaches and open fire first. Now, okay, maybe Sydney would still have been damaged by the exchange, but Sydney had got the first hits in instead and obviously then been able to break and open the range fairly quickly. Then Sydney would probably still be around. On top of that, Cormoran got some amazingly lucky first hits, hitting the bridge and gun director tower that really decapitated the Sydney. That's the bottom line. Extremely unfortunate, but true. Big thank you to Drakenfell for his time, lending his expertise to answer all of my naval questions and appearing in the video. If you haven't seen his channel before, I'll link it below. 
Also, thank you to the patrons whose names you'll see on screen. This has been the second naval video in a row, and for longtime viewers, I know that that probably strikes you as odd, so uh, we'll be back on land for a good while after this. Also, thank you to Slayer. This was his custom video for the mouse tier. I'm not doing custom videos like this anymore. They're actually going to turn into something else. But I do have a couple on backlog, and thank you to him for the really good topic and for his patience. Thanks for watching. Sachen, ich nehme mir auf, 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 au